Yes, here it is. Okay, and I'm going to start the broadcast and let them know we're, we'll get started in just a minute. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for our webinar today. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thanks so much. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. Thank you so much for joining SCNM for today's webinar. We're very excited to bring you this interactive online experience that will let you learn more about the role SCNM and naturopathic medicine are playing in the future of healthcare. My name is Eve Belotus, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, we'll take just a couple minutes to familiarize you with the technology that we'll be using for today's webinar. You should be seeing the control panel on your screen. That's what you'll need to actively participate in today's webinar. So make sure that the control panel is expanded. There should be a box like the one shown in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And if you don't see the box, look for a double arrow. Click these arrows and your box will expand. Second, make sure you can see my desktop, which shows the image of the control panel. That's the window that you'll use to view today's presentation. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions. To do so, just type your questions into the box indicated here, and your questions will be answered verbally at the completion of the presentation. We anticipate today's webinar to run approximately 60 minutes, 40 minutes of presentation, followed by about 20 minutes of question and answer. Before we begin, let me give you a brief introduction to naturopathic medicine. I know many of you are familiar with the, the philosophy and the principles of the medicine, and I know Dr. Mittman will touch on this a little bit more in his presentation. Um, but as you know, NDs con concentrate on whole patient wellness, attempting to find the underlying cause of a patient's condition rather than focusing on just treating the symptoms. And typically, naturopathic doctors use natural therapies rather than synthetic drugs to, uh, to bring their patients to wellness. And NDs follow the principles that you see on your screen. Do no harm, doctor is teacher, healing the power of nature, find the cause, treat the whole person, uh, with, a, with a big emphasis on preventative medicine. During this webinar, you'll be hearing from Dr. Mittman, SCNM's president. Dr. Mittman's presidency at SCNM began in 1999. Throughout his tenure, the college has consistently improved the quality of its education and patient care, contributed new knowledge on naturopathic medicine through research, expanded its outreach to medically underserved communities, and established itself as an innovative, dynamic, and caring community of healers. Dr. Mittman sits on local community boards, the Association of Accredited Naturopathic Medical Colleges, and the New York Association 
of naturopathic physicians. He earned his bachelor's from the State University of New York at Buffalo, his doctorate of naturopathic medicine from National College in Oregon, and a doctor of education from the University of Pennsylvania. Throughout his career, he has been active in licensing efforts and other ways to advance naturopathic medicine. Over the years, numerous organizations have recognized his contributions, and he's received many awards, including the AANMP's President's Award in, 19, uh, in 1990, the AZNMA's Physician of the, Year, uh, Physician of the Year Award, the Spirit of the Rotary Award, and the AANMP's Physician of the, Year, of the Year Award. Many of the year awards. We're very lucky to have him. Um, and Dr. Mittman was also chosen to be a Piper Fellow um, just a couple of years ago. So once again, thank you so much for attending our webinar. We hope you find this presentation both interesting and informative. And feel free to start submitting questions as you hear something that you want to learn more about at the conclusion of the webinar. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Mittman to begin our presentation. Thank you very much, Eve, and welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to, oh, let me see, I'm going to turn my screen on here. Okay, so hopefully everyone should see my screen. If not, send a, a, a note, and we will take care of that. So talking about the role of naturopathic medicine, also the role of of Southwest College in the future of healthcare is very different today than it was just a few years ago, primarily because of the Affordable Care Act. And so we'll touch on ways that naturopathic medicine is going to be an integral part of a patient-centered and team-based approach to healthcare. Um, and it also creates opportunities and challenges to the profession as uh, practitioners will be defining and redefining the role and, and the very practice of naturopathic medicine. The problem today, uh, however, has to do with um, the health of people in the United States, but also the health of people worldwide. Uh, the slide here gives you an kind of a, a window into just one facet of public health, which is the epidemic of obesity and overweight among adults in the United States. And so just to give you a sense, I'll, I'll move us one year ahead just so that you can take a look at this. Um, and, and it's interesting because you don't really need a uh, uh, an image like this to, to convey just how serious this is because all you have to do is go to an airport or a mall or walk around a, a supermarket to get a sense of how, um, you know, how prevalent the problem is. But if you look at these numbers, really everywhere in the United States has an obesity rate of at least 20%. And most of the country is more than a quarter to a third, and there are some parts of the country, you could see there in the darker uh, orange colors, uh, where the obesity rate is more than 35 percent. You know, until recently, uh, there was, you know, there were certain risk factors for obesity, but, um, you know, there was this idea that you could be healthy and overweight. Um, and obese, and a, a recent study came out just in the last two weeks that showed an increased incidence of uh, morbidity or, or illness, but also an increased uh, risk of early death, uh, not from specific disease, but just by virtue of being overweight and obese. The problem, as we uh, as we see it in the um, is mostly, however, that those same risk factors lead to the leading causes of death in the United States. Um, obesity is a risk factor for heart disease, uh, for certain types of cancer, including uh, colorectal cancer, one of the leading causes of death. Um, chronic lower respiratory diseases would um, 
include uh, congestive um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, emphysema, so not there, but certainly for stroke. Uh, it's a risk for uh, Alzheimer's disease, and certainly it's a risk for, um, for diabetes. Diabetes alone is now a condition that includes over 33 million Americans. And if you look over the last 23 years, uh, you'll see an increase in the annual rate of uh, newly diagnosed diabetics that almost tripled during this time. And it's no uh, surprise that, you know, as to what's behind it. So just out of curiosity, uh, and just to, so that you guys don't have to listen to me talk for the next 38 minutes, um, any ideas as to why the incidence of diabetes has skyrocketed according to this graph? And uh, I, I assume that uh, people are able to type in some suggestions. Any ideas? Yeah. So go ahead and type in your suggestions into the question box. Uh, unhealthy food and preservatives, says uh, one attendee. Any other? Sugar. Well, I think those pretty much Inactivity. Oh, well, I'm sorry, one more. Inactivity and processed foods, dietary norms, another one for refined sugars. Very good. Well, here's a picture that kind of captures a lot of what uh, the people here on the, uh, on the webinar just said. Um, the prevalence of fast foods and accessibility of fast foods during the same time period uh, correlates with the increase in uh, both diabetes and uh, overweight and obesity. It's also interesting because you're looking at a kid who looks like they're eating a pretty big burger. And so someone said processed foods and, uh, and simple carbohydrates or simple sugars. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty small kid, but that's a pretty good-sized hamburger. And so the supersizing of, uh, of the food that we eat is certainly part of that as well. Here's your sort of standard American breakfast. I guess this would be like a paleo breakfast because I don't see any toast or um, or uh, hash browns. This would be a little bit more conventional. I, I guess I, I have a question. Just, just think about it. Has bacon become like its own food group now? Uh, you know, here's bacon on pancakes. Uh, I was at a coffee place not too long ago, and the guy said, uh, he said, hey, it's Friday. Guess what we have? I said, I don't know. And uh, bacon chocolate chip cookies. So just out of curiosity, send me your sort of most unusual bacon uh, um, kind of food. I remember uh, it seemed to start in restaurants with uh, bacon-wrapped steak, and then there's bacon-wrapped scallops. Uh, but now, uh, bacon seems to be popping up everywhere as if, you know, the sort of, um, you know, it, it, it could be, you know, any time of day. So, so just out of curiosity, what are some that we have here? Some, some interesting ones. Apparently, there are now bacon parties. I don't know what that means. Maybe Adriana can tell us more. Chocolate-covered bacon at the state fair. I can vouch for that. A friend just gave me chocolate-covered bacon from a trip she came back on. Uh, bacon waffles, bacon bowls, and bacon-flavored juice. That's a new one for me. Yeah. Wow. Well, we could add that to bacon ice cream because we've seen that. Uh, I've yet to see bacon smoothies, but that can't be uh, far behind if there's already uh, bacon-flavored juice. And you know, it's interesting because it's, and it, you know, it's not just a question, it, it's not just a health or a practitioner or a purely nutritional question because, you know, imagine that you're a young person and you're growing up in this period of bacon juice, bacon-covered chocolate or chocolate-covered bacon, uh, bacon ice cream, etc. That's the new norm. 
And so it's not just about, well, naturopathic medicine, you know, will tell patients the right way to eat. The problem is, is that kids are being, you know, kind of inoculated or indoctrinated with this message that, um, you know, that you could eat bacon any time of the day and it's okay. You know, or you could have, I think, Taco Bell had fourth meal. Uh, now Jack in the Box has, um, they have some kind of, uh, it's some kind of late night, uh, sort of like a munchy meal. And it's interesting because it must have something to do with uh, the legalization of mar marijuana or medical marijuana because, you know, the commercials are people, you know, who look like they, you know, they are uh, a little bit out of it and they have the munchies. And so the problem, you know, becomes, like, is, is that what we really need, you know, for people to eating four square meals a day or to be encouraging people to drive out in the middle of the night, especially if they're impaired, uh, to go out and eat fast food? Well, here's another, uh, another type. Someone mentioned sugar. Um, you know, this is sort of the classic supersized, um, you know, burger and fries. And as you can see, uh, you know, these kinds of um, promotions and this kind of nutrition doesn't only affect humans. Well, I don't know. I've never seen a pigeon quite that big. And I will uh, confess that uh, I'm not completely immune to the idea of eating empty calories. I should say that this uh, picture was interesting. I was in California uh, riding my bicycle up to the top of Mount Palomar. And it's one of the sort of like classic hill climb rides with a lot of switchbacks and very steep. And uh, the reward was that there was a vegetarian restaurant. There's a vegetarian restaurant just beyond my uh, left hand there. Uh, at the top of Mount Palomar, and it happened to be closed uh, on whatever day of the week that was, uh, a Monday or a Tuesday. And uh, all that was left was um, a soda machine or sort of a fast food place. And I always saw people drinking uh, Coke in bicycle races, and so I thought, well, I'll try that out. I have to get back to ride down this thing and get back into town. Uh, and so that's the idea of empty calories. Has anyone seen? The, um, there, there is a way to measure. Uh, there's a nutritional density index. At Whole Foods, they call it ANDI, A-N-D-I. And they actually rank foods according to their nutritional density. So in other words, how many nutrients do you get per calorie? And so in this case, it would be zero, because you're not getting any other nutrients or practically no other nutrients. Whereas foods that are nutrient dense, like dark green leafy vegetables like kale or Swiss chard, et cetera, would be at the top of the chart, somewhere around 1,000. Well, this gives you an idea of where things are going. Um, and uh, so let's take a look at a, a couple of these. And the, the, one of the points that I want to make here is that for naturopathic medicine, <laughs> Uh, as Eve mentioned in, when she was talking about the principles of naturopathic medicine, there's no magic uh, supplement or herb or acupuncture point or no special treatment that can undo a lifetime of eating unhealthy food or, or, or being sedentary. Uh, and so really, nutrition is the core of naturopathic medicine. Uh, you are what you eat. Uh, and in naturopathic medicine, that's almost always the first place that we start. And so most of this talk is going to be focused on this idea of plant-based nutrition. And this is something that is gaining a lot of traction because there are some pretty popular books like the Engine 2 Diet by Rip Esselstyn or the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by his father, the physician <coughs> Caldwell Esselstyn. I think for the purpose of this talk, you know, I think we can expand plant-based to mean <coughs> uh, 
a diet that it might not be exclusively plant-based. Uh, in other words, devoid of all meat, fish, uh, poultry, etc., but one that is predominantly plant-based. And, and I should say, kind of in full disclosure, that I follow a plant-based diet that you know, that does not include, um, you know, it, it is purely plant, so uh, vegetables, grains, fruits, uh, no meat, no chicken, no fish, uh, no dairy products. But I think for most people, there's probably a bigger uh, popula part of the population that would just do well to switch to a predominantly plant-based diet. So it's interesting. This is a um, an article that was in the um, this was in uh, Kaiser Permanent's uh, letter to uh, all of their doctors on the West Coast. And basically, it was a letter explaining, uh, a journal article, explaining how uh, the evidence behind a plant-based diet for heart disease, for diabetes, and to prevent certain kinds of cancer should be one of the primary interventions that physicians employ. Another article that uh, basically, uh, again, will not only have the opportunity to prevent disease, but can also, um, as you can see, uh, prevent disease, lower hemoglobin A1C, which is your um, uh, long-range blood sugar levels, lower lipids like cholesterol, and decrease the number of medications needed to treat disease. And here is a place, this is the place that naturopathic medicine can add the most value, is to be able to work with patients in a multidisciplinary setting, in community clinics. Uh, we have NDs who are in charge of diabetes programs on uh, tribal lands uh, in the Indian Health Service. These are opportunities for naturopathic physicians to not just do what the Affordable Care Act has already done, which is increase access to care, but actually begin to affect people's health in a positive way and start to bring down what they call bend the cost curve. Because the only thing that's going to lower costs in healthcare is keeping people healthy. There's no there's no way to, um, you know, you could be more efficient about treating people with chronic diseases, but the best way is to prevent them from getting chronic disease in the first place or to use simple life-changing uh, approaches like nutrition, diet, exercise, stress management. This is a very interesting study that came out uh, just a few weeks ago. In the Annals of Internal Medicine, and it looked at middle-aged people and, and what happened to them 15 to 20 years later, both in, and the end point was who had fewer deaths, which group had fewer deaths, which group had fewer chronic diseases, which group was on fewer medications. It was a study, the Nurses' Health Study, looked over 10,000 participants and found, again, that even a modest change, a modest movement to a plant-based diet, in this case, they were using the Mediterranean diet, which does include some fish, uh, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of cheese, and plenty of olive oil, um, showed a 40% decrease in the incidence of chronic diseases and uh, premature deaths. That is, I mean, think about it for a moment. <clears throat> Can anyone think of a drug that could lower the rate of um, chronic disease by 40%? There's no statin that will do that, that's for sure. The same can be said for cancer. And here is an interesting, um, an interesting study. I don't know how many people here have uh, read the book, The China Study by a nutritional biochemist named T. Colin Campbell. 
he teaches at Cornell University. And basically, back in the early 1980s, they looked at uh, a phenomenon in China that we don't see in the United States or in most Western countries. In China at the time, the rate of cancer varied significantly across the country. And not only did the rate of cancer, but the different types of cancer varied significantly uh, in, across the country. And so they went out and they uh, had a team of researchers who went to cities and villages all around the country. What they expected was they expected perhaps poverty or um, economic uh, attainment, socioeconomic status, would probably be the driving forces between who got cancer at lower rates or higher rates. And it turned out that it was the consumption of animal protein. And here's a very interesting uh, observation, that they found that animal consumption, where it exceeded 5% of total caloric consumption, tended to uh, you know, led to higher rates of cancer. So it's very interesting because think for a moment when you think about the discussions that we have in the United States about food. We mostly, if you think about which macronutrient do we focus on the most, protein, carbohydrates, or fat? And I would say, you know, going back to the 1980s, you know, we're fairly fat obsessed. <clears throat> Turns out here that a um, that in this particular research that it was the protein level as much as it was fat or other nutrients. So it's very interesting. Um, we tend to see that in certain kinds of cancer, particularly colorectal cancer and also in uh, prostate cancer. And here is an interesting study uh, done by Dean Ornish and a group of researchers in California that not only looked at preventing prostate cancer, but they can actually um, modify or sort of downregulate cancer growth depending on what the person eats. Huh. So think about that for a minute. Um, between the China study, which looked at protein content, and what Ornish was looking at, how could something like food affect cancer? And the answer is in the um, emerging field of epigenetics. Epigenetics is uh, that part of the human genome that is uh, that could be modified during a person's lifetime. And, and for this, we used to think that, um, you know, what we thought about from, from a genetic standpoint, we thought that, you know, our genes coded for our skin color and height, our eye color, hair color, um, different traits that you were born with. And, um, and that, that, was, that was really our understanding of genetics you know, and, and certain predispositions for disease. But the genetic information for all of that was contained only within a few percent of our chromosomes. The other genes were considered dark genes, or it was even called junk DNA. It was just there. Nobody knew why. It turns out that what was thought almost 96% or over 96% of our genes was this kind of darker junk DNA that didn't code for you know, very obvious things like you know, those characteristics I talked about or certain diseases. It turned out that that's kind of like our operating system. And there are things that we encounter in the world that can either turn those genes on or turn those genes off, or upregulate them, or 
downregulate them. And it turns out that food happens to be one of those. And of the nutrients in food, we know that certain fats, particularly bad fats like trans fats, can affect it. But of the nutrients in food, the macronutrients, protein is probably the most important source there. And so in a sense, what we're saying is that food, if it, if it turns DNA on or off or up or down, in a sense we're saying that food is like information. It's like food is information that our bodies take in and, and it affects how we operate. Which is really pretty fascinating because until not too long ago, we thought that food, you know, food was energy, calories, right? Calories are energy. We need energy to live. We need carbohydrates for energy. We need protein because it forms the building blocks for us to repair damaged tissues and for organ repair, things like that. Um, we needed fat because there were membranes. Uh, we make hormones out of fat. But this idea, and, and of course antioxidants, which are protective vitamins and uh, that act as, as catalysts, and minerals have a role. But this idea of food as information is really quite, it's quite new and it's quite fascinating. Because in naturopathic medicine, we say that quality is as important as quantity. And so when we talk about the quality of the food that a person eats, we're talking about not just you know, the, the total calories or the percent fat calories, or are you getting your uh, your RDA for this or that nutrient, but what's the quality of the food in terms of is it raised with pesticides and herbicides? Is it food, is it an animal that is shot full of hormones or animals that are given antibiotics on a daily basis? not to treat or even prevent disease, but just so that they can grow faster, so somebody can make more money. Uh, and, and it used to be that this was important to us within the naturopathic profession because you don't want to take in exogenous and dangerous molecules, you know, let's say pesticides or herbicides, or you say, well, you don't want it to affect the environment adversely because we uh, you know, need to be good stewards of our environment. But it also turns out that the quality of the food, the quality of the protein could directly affect our personal health by upregulating or downregulating our own genes. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of seconds. These are some, this was probably the biggest study that came out uh, last April in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a study in Spain that looked at a huge number of people, uh, 7,447 people. And these were not healthy people. These were people who were already at risk for uh, heart disease. Um, and the outcomes were a nearly third uh, decrease in the risk of heart disease and strokes by switching to a Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet, again, I would say will fall within this kind of broad umbrella of a plant-based diet. All right, so six reasons to move to a plant-based diet. And these are six reasons that at Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine that this is part of our nutrition curriculum. And it's part of a program that we offer to patients I'll tell you a little bit more about in a, in a couple of minutes. You know, first of all is to 
uh, get to the right weight. We talked about reducing risk for heart disease, for cancer, also to reduce risk to reduce inflammation. You know, inflammation used to be something that we thought of primarily uh, in acute conditions, but it turns out that inflammation plays an important role in many chronic diseases, not just arthritis or, or painful conditions, but also in chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. And the kinds of research that I shared with you about heart disease and cancer is also true for, um, for inflammatory conditions. How does switching to a plant-based or eating more of a plant-based diet help protect the environment? Well, it turns out that uh, cattle production contributes, depending on the study, from a third to 60% of carbon emissions worldwide. Check that out. Simply the production, the factory farming of cattle can contribute as much or perhaps more than uh, transportation. In fact, uh, it's been written that if everyone gave up eating meat one day a week, it would have more of an impact on the environment than if everybody in the world drove a Prius. That's pretty amazing. Um, it's also important because uh, the majority of antibiotics prescribed, well, they're actually not prescribed, consumed in the United States are consumed by animals. More than 60% of antibiotics in the United States are given to animals. So what is that, how does that affect our health? Well, number one, it affects our health because it uh, increases the number of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're becoming more and more careful about um, not over-prescribing antibiotics in humans, but it turns out that the indiscriminate use of antibiotics it's actually part of um, many animals' feed. It's just given in their feed, uh, like I said earlier, because it, um, it promotes growth somehow. It's not understood how. Uh, prescription is not needed, and in fact, farmers can buy them <laughs> just at feed stores. Uh, just last week, the Food and Drug Administration came out with a new ruling that in three years will prohibit the use of antibiotics for uh, solely to promote growth. Uh, unfortunately, there's a loophole in that rule in that uh, farmers could still use them to prevent disease, which is a pretty big uh, loophole. Treating animals humanely is uh, a little bit of a different story that has to do more with factory farming. On the other hand, you know, think about the food that you eat and uh, I, sh I should say that you know I, I follow a plant-based diet now, uh, but my father was a butcher, my grandfather was a butcher. I love to eat meat, and I don't really have an issue with people eating meat. Uh, but I would say, think about where you get your food from, because um, you know, where you get your food from uh, can really vary in terms of how it's raised and how the animals are treated. Uh, we've been doing a um, class in plant-based nutrition. You know, I've got this thing on the side here. I'm just going to okay, move that. And these are the results. We've offered a six-week class four times now. We've had uh, well over 100 participants in it. And overwhelmingly, people lower their cholesterol. The average drop in cholesterol is 26 milligrams per deciliter, uh, which is pretty significant for such a short period of time. Uh, one person uh, had their cholesterol go down nearly 100 points, um, and the smallest being one. And in that 18% where it doesn't, uh, the most that it's gone up, for whatever reason, was 15 milligrams per deciliter. 
basically the idea behind a plant-based uh, program is looking at when you eat a diet, whether it's a Mediterranean diet or a plant-based or vegan diet, um, you are getting a healthy fat composition. So fats, in addition to providing us energy, they're really important for cell membrane uh, development, protection. Uh, our brains uh, have a very high percentage of essential fatty acids in them. Uh, we also make hormones like uh, testosterone, uh, estrogen are made from fats. Protein, we talked earlier about, you know, that when we think about quantity, people always ask, are you getting enough protein? Um, but the quality of the protein is really important. You know, protein is an interesting, uh, that's an interesting discussion for some other time. Perhaps if I get to meet some of you, we can have that, uh, that dialogue there. But, you know, people always ask me, um, you know, are you getting enough protein? You know, and I uh, am a bicycle racer, and so I'm very aware of, uh, you know, the need to maintain muscle mass. Uh, but it turns out that our bodies are incredibly efficient at preserving protein. We hold on to protein. Every cell that gets recycled, we keep that protein. Uh, and in fact, the earliest, one of the earliest signs of kidney disease is having protein in the urine. So our kidneys might filter the blood, but they keep the protein in so that we can reuse it. Uh, antioxidants, I think people know quite a bit about that. <laughs> this last one, the human microbiome support, is really fascinating. I'm going to flip that slide uh, here. Uh, so many people uh, are familiar with a, um, uh, a molecule called TMAO. And TMAO is trimethylamine nitroxide. And it turns out that TMAO is found in people with heart disease. Heart disease, uh, angina, and heart attacks, there's a strong correlation between someone's blood level or serum level of TMAO. The higher the TMAO level, the higher the prevalence um, of heart disease, coronary artery disease. <coughs> Turns out researchers at the Cleveland Clinic discovered that TMAO is actually made in the intestine by a bacteria. So take a moment and let that sink in. We have bacteria living in our gut that can affect our own personal health? How mind-boggling is that? Well, it turns out that we have over 10 trillion cells living in, on, and around our bodies every day. They outnumber us 10 to 1. When I, so for me, I've got 10 trillion cells that outnumber the cells in my body. 10 to 1. So it makes me wonder, well, am I just Paul Mittman, or is it Paul Mittman and this little kind of micro uh, cosm that walks around with me, this little um, micro environment where there are bacteria, viruses, yeasts living not just in the gut, but in our eyes, nose, certainly in the mouth, vagina, anus, ears, and on our skin. And so the food that we eat is not only about what we put into our mouths is going to end up in our systems, but it's also we've got, we've got these 10 trillion cells to support. We've got 10 trillion mouths to feed. And the kind of food that's healthy that we eat had better not only be healthy to who we kind of classically thought we are, but it also needs to be healthy to maintain 
this human microbiome, you know, what we used to call, you know, just gut flora. Well, it turns out it's a lot bigger than that. So that is pretty much uh, what I wanted to share with you about uh, nutrition uh, and the role that it plays uh, in naturopathic medicine and also in, um, in our personal health and the health of our patients. I'll share with you just a, a few pictures about where the school is going, um, talk a little bit about the profession and uh, the profession's emerging role in healthcare, and then uh, we'll have some time for some questions in just a couple of minutes. Uh, basically, this is uh, the before was the way the campus looked about a month ago. Uh, and you could look at the top in the middle there. There was a small building that got knocked down. And we have construction going right now to put this new building in place. It's going to look like this. Uh, should be ready for next fall. Uh, we are told uh, the building itself will be done next summer, and then furniture, fixtures, and equipment will go in in August and September in time for the um, for the fall 2014 quarter. Uh, the building that will be the entrance to the building. The building is a two-story, almost 48,000 square foot facility, and the reason that I'm talking about this partly because as a president of a college, uh, new buildings are very important to us because it means that the school is growing uh, and serving our needs in new ways. But also because a lot of what we were talking about earlier is really going to um, be supported in this new building. So as you can see on the first floor of the floor plan, uh, there will be an organic cafe. Uh, with seating inside and outside. It'll be just under 4,000 square feet. And then in the sort of gold-colored uh, room <coughs> just uh, beyond the stairs there, you can see a demo kitchen. And so the classes that we've taught in plant-based nutrition, we will expand to Mediterranean diet, another form of plant-based. We'll have a class in um, gluten-free living and actually be able to um, have participants uh, try their hand at cooking and doing different demos. The class right now that we offer includes a potluck, a presentation, and then a little cooking demo. But this will give us an opportunity to expand that. Uh, then a uh, large auditorium, about 250 seats. And then, as you can see in that area where it looks like a nautilus shell, that is going to be a naturopathic integrative pain center. We're calling it a regenerative health center. And this will give us an opportunity to explore pain, which, again, you know, you can't, um, you can't effectively deal with pain without making sure that the person is eating a healthy diet. We talked about inflammation earlier, and that will play a role there. But it also is important because it turns out that 80% of patients present to the doctor because of pain. And we feel that with the uh, skills and tools and uh, resources that we have here, that we can bring something really special that will include naturopathic physicians, acupuncture, manipulation, chiropractic, and physical therapy, and also um, anesthesiology and injection therapies. And so that is going to be an important part. And then the natural medicinary is our dispensary. Second floor will have a beautiful library. I think uh, you could see, get a sense of um, some of the other parts. There's a boardroom there. But then there's going to be a fitness facility with yoga, tai chi, maybe spin classes. And so this idea about you know, walking the talk, uh, about creating a, um, a healthy environment is important for our patients, but it's equally important for our students and for the people who work here. Then some classrooms, open study areas, a tutoring center, and then um, there in the middle where the restrooms are, there'll be lockers and showers for students as well. And I think 
but that is about it. Um, I could talk a little bit, perhaps during the Q and A period, about um, uh, you know some of the other roles that NDs are beginning to play. Uh, we just uh, opened a clinic rotation in a federally qualified community health center. Uh, the role that NDs are playing on Indian reservations. Uh, I was at Cancer Treatment Centers of America uh, last week, where they they already have 57 naturopathic physicians uh, on staff. Um, but I think that you know this idea that um, if we put the patient at the center, then it's going to become increasingly apparent that we need a team. And uh, I don't I don't mean to say that naturopathic physicians have all the answers but we certainly have important answers to some of the most pressing questions of our day. So thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure uh, interacting electronically with you, and I look forward to uh, some of your questions. Eve? Thanks so much, Dr. Mittman. So one of our questions is about GMOs. Can you talk about how one gets around GMOs in today's society? And if you could talk about how you see GMOs affecting uh, the lives of the patients uh, that that MDs treat. Well, thanks. You know, the question about GMOs again comes down to this um, distinction between quantity versus quality, uh, and there's very little evidence that GMO-derived uh, food is quantitatively any different than food that is non-GMO or even organic food. On the other hand, uh, what we don't know is qualitatively, are there other genetic, hidden genetic surprises in GMO food, whether it could be snippets of other uh, organisms, uh, could it be allergic components? Uh, there have already been uh, certain nut allergies identified in, in GMO foods, or, you know, do GMO foods, um, the process of manufacturing GMO foods, which very few people uh, understand, um, involves some potentially very hazardous um, uh, possibilities with, um, you know, uh, with potentially dangerous viral strain. And so, you know, how to deal with that is, in the United States, is really hard. Um, you know, there are, um, you know, there is a lot of cross-contamination, uh, and there are certain types of foods, like soy products and corn, where GMO is so prevalent that it's hard to know whether you're eating uh, GMO or non-GMO foods. You know, right now, uh, probably the best thing to do is to uh, eat as much organic food as you can, as you can afford. Um, we have, um, I think it's available on our website, in the Environmental Working Group, you've got the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And so those tend to be the safest foods from an herbicide and pesticide standpoint, but many of them uh, hold true from a GMO standpoint. Uh, I have to say uh, Whole Foods you know, made a commitment to labeling everything uh, as to whether it would contain GMO, I think by 2016. And the rest of it's going to be on a state-by-state -state basis. So if this is something that um, you feel strongly about, you know, there are plenty of opportunities uh, to get involved in your own community. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about the Affordable Care Act and generally how you see that affecting the profession and more specifically, if it includes more patient access to naturopathic medicine to be covered by insurance. Yeah, actually, we have a meeting with um, Arizona's insurance director, and we've been in communication with the governor here. And this has been going on in several states uh, because the uh, Affordable Care Act has a non-discrimination provision in it uh, that prevents discrimination against um, any licensed practitioner. So I think the short answer is that yes, it will increase access and will increase coverage for naturopathic services in states where naturopathic medicine is licensed. 
Um, on the, from a different angle, I was fortunate to be at a talk by the uh, president and CEO of Aetna. And uh, he feels so strongly about naturopathic medicine that he said that it will be covered uh, in every area where naturopathic medicine is licensed. <coughs> the reason for that, for him, part of it was his own personal experience. But I think another driving force for that kind of approach is that uh, the Affordable Care Act essentially capitates health care. And so rather than just being paid, uh, you know, ad infinitum for every visit procedure uh, that is performed, uh, doctors are going to be responsible for people's health. So the healthier you keep people, the more money there is. Uh, because if people need to be hospitalized, that's very expensive. If people need to go back to the hospital, that's extremely expensive. And one of the best ways to keep people healthy is to build a team of practitioners. And there was an entire issue in health affairs last month devoted to this idea of creating a team-based approach uh, that um, is, is really paramount for maintaining health and dealing with people who already have chronic disease. And there's no better profession to include on that team than naturopathic physicians. Thank you. Um, I am cognizant of the time. Um, this We have reached about an hour of the webinar, but we'll continue to do questions and answers for about five minutes. So hopefully you will be able to stay. Um, if not, the webinar and the questions will be recorded and posted on our website. But we do have a few more questions that we'd love to get through. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to, to join us for those. So Dr. Mittman, we have a question about homeopathy. Um, somebody is wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, where you think the future of homeopathy is going, given sort of the, uh, that this person has found it to be very effective, um, but sometimes finds that people don't quite believe in it since it's not quite as evidence-based or logical to some people. Um, can you speak a little about homeopathy and where you see it going? Well, that's kind of a loaded question for me because, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, Eve, I came here uh, in 1997 to teach homeopathy. I was the chair of the homeopathy department here, and after becoming president a few years later, I was fortunate to get Dr. Stephen Messer to join our faculty. And so the direction of homeopathy at SCNM is up because we have, um, we've been able to procure funding uh, for the last six years for a homeopathy resident. Uh, homeopathy is a very important part of the curriculum. You know, when I said earlier that, you know, there's no magic uh, treatment, there's no magic remedy for people uh, if you don't address people's uh, diet and lifestyle. And in fact, in the the primary homeopathy text, the Organon of Medicine, it actually says that. That's not only homeopathic medicine, but also how uh, you work with patients and how they live. Homeopathy falls into that category of quantity versus quality. Uh, it's hard to imagine in a reductionistic, almost mechanistic uh, world of healthcare that something a very low dose can have profound effects on patients. Uh, but it turns out that we're learning more and more that um, very small changes, you know, like I was talking earlier about a gut bacteria that produces a, um, a molecule that can affect a human being's life. And so, you know, I think there will be, you know, uh, growth in the um, research on homeopathy, uh, for which there actually is research on the effectiveness of homeopathy. But I would just say that at the college, homeopathy plays a very, um, you know, has a, a very strong department for students who want to uh, pursue additional training in homeopathy, there's ample opportunity for that. Great, thank you. Dr. Mittman, can you talk a little bit about what SCNM is doing to prepare NDs to be successful after they graduate, um, touching maybe a little bit on the curriculum, the career center, et cetera? Yeah, sure. 
Um, a couple of things come to mind right off the bat. You mentioned a career center. And you know, I'm proud to say that our career center has been in operation for 12 years. We were the first school to have one. And a lot of the innovations in the career center get copied elsewhere, which is OK. I guess that's that form of flattery. Um, it was really important for us then, and it's especially important now, for our students to not just be successful <coughs> and competent clinicians, but you know they have to understand how to make a living in this changing healthcare environment. And so the Career Center uh, works with students on building resumes. Uh, we have Postmasters here so that students can learn public speaking. We have um, pretty regular, uh, at least monthly, uh, presentations by alumni on how to start and how to run a successful practice. We have a very well-received practice management series of classes. And then the Career Center is open not just to our students while they're in school, but it's also open to students after they graduate. So that, you know, from the Career Center standpoint, it's really important, and, it, and it's hard sometimes for students to appreciate how important that is until they graduate, because the pressures of, you know, of other classes uh, are pretty strong. But uh, it turns out that the Career Center has grown and grown in popularity. Um, the curriculum is, is, very, uh, is also very interesting. I'm, I'm really proud that the school has uh, led the way in many innovations. And one of them is the curriculum. We were the first naturopathic school to change the curriculum in at least 30 years. Uh, and we've moved to more of a, an integrated model. So rather than having your first year <coughs> divided among many disciplines, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, microbiology, genetics, embryology, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they're taught in a systems-based block. And so um, whatever you're learning in uh, anatomy, you're also touching upon in biochemistry. So it's more about systems like cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, neurological, urological, kidney, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the curriculum also introduces students to their clinical experiences the first week of school. So, you know, it's really important for students to not just sit in class and learn about the human body, health and immune disease, but also to develop the hands-on experiences to be able to do the history, the physical examination. And not only does that increase students' interest and engagement, but also there's a lot of research, um, or there's research in medical education that attaining skills disproportionately benefits uh, medical students. And so having, um, having that introduced so early in the curriculum has been really positive as well. Thanks, Dr. Mittman. And we have for one last question. Dr. Mittman, can you talk a little bit about how you recommend uh, implementing plant-based diets in those, given that a large percentage of our population live in food deserts? Well, you know, food deserts, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that there, you know, there are cultural and um, other, you know, interests that, you know, that influence the way that we eat. Being in a food desert is a socioeconomic um, variable, that, that's really challenging. Um, and it's not just about clinicians. You know, this is about how communities work together. Uh, and, you know, in, in addressing, you know, living in a food desert, you know, really requires the uh, partnership between communities, um, community action or community assistance programs, um, community action agencies, and you know, developing things like CSAs or community gardens, uh, having uh, locally grown food and farmers markets. You know, fortunately, a lot of that is starting to take hold. I know here in um, the Phoenix metropolitan area, that's becoming you know a, a real growing phenomenon, and it's um, you know hopefully that that can make a difference. 
you know, for an individual, you know, the, the question is, uh, how do you do it? And, you know, for, for a lot of people, it's just about, you know, taking it one step at a time, uh, making certain changes to eliminate, um, you know, do like the meatless Monday. You know, pick one day out of the week. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of great recipes online. I mentioned the Engine 2 uh, people. <coughs> There's also a great website called Happy Healthy Long Life, which has literally hundreds of recipes. And, um, you know, take it one one day at a time, maybe one day a week at first, you know, would be one way to do it. Um, you know, uh, getting together with neighbors and having potlucks. We have someone in our neighborhood who does that, and it's a great way not just to uh, eat healthy, but also to share ideas and, you know, increase uh, someone's social network. Thanks very much, Dr. Mittman, for that. I want to thank welcome. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us a little bit this afternoon about nutrition and the role that NDs play in the future of SCNN. Very quickly, I just want to share with all of you a little bit of information about admissions to SCNM for those of you that are ready to to take the next step in your um, in your career and and start exploring being an ND. So on the screen, you see the admissions requirements that we have for the program. As many of you know, this is a four-year doctoral program, and we do require students coming into the program to have a four-year bachelor's degree, as well as completion of the prerequisite coursework that you see on your screen. I would say the best thing for you to do is to send us in copies of your unofficial transcripts. And that way we can make um, a quick assessment of what prerequisite classes, if any, you might still be needing. And once you're at the point where you're ready to, to go through the application process, um, we use a centralized application service called NDCAS, where you would send in your transcripts, upload all of that info, uh, upload, upload all of the classes that you've taken, um, have letters of recommendation sent on your behalf, complete an essay. And then after that process, um, if you meet the, the application requirements, then you would be invited to come in for an in-person interview. We do have two intakes, one in the fall and one in the winter. Um, and we are accepting applications for fall. And we still have a couple classes left, or a couple spots left in our winter class um, for those of you that are, are ready to, to start this exciting future. So um, if you have any questions about admissions requirements or if you have any additional questions about today's presentation that weren't answered, feel free to contact me. Um, you can see my information on the screen. Or of course, you can always just send a general uh, email to the admissions box at SCNM. We're so excited that you took the time to, to spend with us today to learn a little bit more about the profession. Um, stay tuned for information about our next webinar. Um, and with that, let me thank Dr. Mittman again for taking the time this morning. Um, and we look forward to, to connecting with you in the future and helping you fulfill your dream of becoming a naturopathic doctor. Thanks again so much for joining us, um, and we look forward to connecting with you soon. This concludes our webinar. Have a wonderful week, and uh, enjoy the holiday season. Thanks very much.